This is Sam of Historian Explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. These lectures are on SoundCloud, Stitcher, YouTube, and other platforms. And if you can help to keep them coming, please go to my Patreon page. The link will be in the description. And if you've been listening to these lectures previously, I mentioned that I'm hoping to get another historian to collaborate on an episode of this series on 100 Objects. We have not worked out the logistics of that as of yet, so that will have to wait. And in the meantime, I want to continue with the series. So this will be number 19, Three Silver Higa Amulets. So this is a set of three pendant amulets each one in the form of a forearm with a closed fist. They are made of silver or silver alloy. They range from about half an inch to two-thirds of an inch long, and they were found in a midden pile at the site of a Spanish fortified outpost at Los Adalles in what is now present-day northwestern Louisiana, and they're dated to the mid-18th century. So firstly, as for the context of where these amulets came from, what is Los Adalles? It was the name for a Spanish mission and presidio, or small fortress, near the edge, right near the border of French and Spanish control between what was then the Spanish province of Texas and the French colony of Louisiana. And this outpost at Los Adalles was first built in 1716, and it was sited about 20 miles to the west of a French colonial town called Natchitoches in Louisiana, which had been founded just three years earlier in 1713. So the official rationale for creating this Spanish site at Los Adalles was in order to missionize the local Indian tribe called the Adai, which were part of the larger Caddo Confederation. But really, it was actually understood that the real purpose of this fortress and mission actually was to serve as a point of communication and trade with the French in Louisiana. And much of that trade, probably almost all of it, was actually illegal smuggling. So the Spanish Empire at this point tried to prohibit trade between the Spanish colonies and foreign powers, such as the British, the Dutch, and the French, who were actually siphoning off a lot of the wealth and trade goods from the Spanish Empire into northern Europe. So Spain was trying to enforce an exclusivity and a dependence upon Spain for trade with the Spanish colonies, but many regions really couldn't survive or prosper without that trade with northern Europeans. And so it was understood that, in fact, points of sort of managed underground illegal trade were necessary. And so the original mission, which was known as San Miguel de Linares de los Adalles, was created in 1716. It was then shortly after destroyed by the French in 1719 during the brief period of war between Spain and France. And if you've listened to my series about Florida, you might remember there was that moment of change in the late 1710s when France and Spain briefly became enemies and the French successfully captured Pensacola to the east of Louisiana, and also they sent a party west, which destroyed this outpost at Los Adalles in 1719. But it was rebuilt again, this time about two miles to the east, so even closer to the Louisiana colony, and it was started up again and added on to the mission this time was a presidio, a small palisaded fortress to help defend the site. And this presidio was called Nuestra Señora del Pilar de los Adalles. So collectively, the presidio and the mission adjoining one another were just called Los Adalles. And in 1729, Spain actually made Los Adalles the capital of the province of Texas, or what we now know as Texas. And they built a grand governor's house there at the site. So it was understood, really, that, that Texas was sort of a forward-facing buffer zone colony to manage relations with the French in Louisiana. And this outpost at Los Adalles was 400 miles away from San Antonio, which was the nearest Spanish town. So it was really quite isolated and, in this way, really very dependent on this smuggling trade with the French. 
They did establish some cattle ranches in the general area around the mission, which could supply some amount of food, and there also were gardens and small farms, but really not enough even to feed just the small Catholic mission and the garrison at the Presidio. And so it was totally dependent, even for basic supplies, on trade with Louisiana, even for food and for weapons. Now, despite this dependency, the trade did flourish, and there was some degree of prosperity, it seems, at Los Adalles in the 1730s to 1750s. But this period of prosperity was interrupted when Spain took over control of Louisiana in 1764. So again, you may remember the Seven Years' War, in which Spain and France were allies, it ended with a very complicated diplomatic bargain in which colonies were shifted around like sacks of potatoes, as some would say, among the colonial powers. And Louisiana was transferred to Spanish control. And what that meant is that now Los Adalles was no longer an important site for trade. It was no longer this hub and connection point between the French and Spanish empires. And those goods from Louisiana instead could be accessed by Spanish colonists directly through New Orleans. So Los Adalles suddenly became quite irrelevant, and it fell into poverty in the 1760s. And the capital of the province was then moved down to San Antonio in 1772. And hence, it was no longer politically or militarily important either. And finally, the site was completely abandoned the following year in 1773. So how did it come about that these peculiar silver objects ended up being found at this long-forgotten site in what's now Louisiana? Well, after the abandonment in 1773, the site was simply left empty, and gradually the foundations of the Presidio and the mission were overgrown and fell into e either agricultural use or just wilderness. And then after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, when the United States obtained the Louisiana colony, the U.S. and Spain came to loggerheads and had to work out and negotiate their border. And they agreed on leaving a neutral strip, a sort of, you could say, demilitarized zone between the American territory of Louisiana and the Spanish province of Texas. And this neutral strip included Los Adalles. And hence that site, despite its possible utility, it was never reoccupied or rebuilt. And for more than a century, it was left completely undisturbed. Now, in the early 1900s, when there was an increasing interest in American colonial history, some people did seek out and try to locate the site of what had been Los Adalles. And the parish, Natchitoches Parish, which includes that zone in the northwest of Louisiana, the parish government bought the site in 1931 and began to try to preserve or excavate it in some way. But the state of Louisiana then bought it in 1979, and only after that point in the 1980s did excavations begin. And these excavations were only very small and tentative, and even up to today, only about 5% of the site of Los Adalles has been excavated. But they did nonetheless make significant finds that revealed something about the layout and nature of this Spanish colonial outpost. So archaeologists found large walls and a bastion of the Presidio. They also excavated what seems to be a civilian house and a large kitchen adjoining it. They also found a blacksmith's forge nearby the walls of the Presidio. And it seems that various small objects like pieces of dishware or firearms have been found sort of scattered around what might be a, a midden or trash dump. And it seems that these three silver amulets were found in that midden area within the barracks where the soldiers, the small garrison of soldiers, were housed inside the Presidio. And these amulets have been identified as higas. So this word higa, it's of not entirely clear derivation. It might come from roots in Latin, but it was commonly used in Spanish. And it seems that amulets of this type were often produced in Spain and sometimes in the Spanish colony. So a higa is an amulet that ends with a 
hand, a closed hand, in the form of a fist with the thumb sticking out between the index and middle finger. And it's believed that this form of the fist is intended to mimic the appearance of female sex organs, or maybe even to evoke childbirth with the, the child coming out of the birth canal. And it seems that higas in this basic form were made in the Roman Empire and then also very much in the Islamic world. And you may remember Spain was an Islamic kingdom through most of the Middle Ages and many sort of customs and art forms like ceramic tile work and mosaics carried over from that Islamic era into modern Spain. So it seems that this custom of making protective higa amulets continued into the Christian Spanish era. And some of them made in Spain are traditionally made of jet. That's common. And other sort of stones and minerals have been used. And often it seems that they were attached to the bridles of horses for good luck and maybe also for protection. And it seems that higas of this kind were often given out at pilgrimage sites such as Santiago de Compostela in Spain, which is one of the big pilgrimage sites in Europe. And pilgrims, it seems, would travel to Santiago, get one of these higas, and then carry them back with them for protection and a safe journey on their return trip. So these are all uses, it seems, of the higa. But mainly, especially after 1600 or so, mainly it seems that the higas were prized and used as protection against the evil eye. The idea that a person with ill intent, envy, malice, can actually project sort of harmful energy at the person that they gaze upon with this evil eye. And there is a long history, going back really as long as recorded history, of fear of the evil eye. It's very widespread in the ancient and classical world, in the medieval and the Islamic world. And the evil eye also has a particular connection, it seems, to childbirth. It's often thought that the evil eye causes many of the dangers and troubles of childbirth and infancy when there was very frequent infant mortality from diseases as well as possible birth defects, stillbirths, and also injuries and infections to the mother. So there's a close association for a long time between the evil eye and the dangers of childbirth. And also part of why the evil eye specifically was connected to the dangers of childbirth is that one of the common problems that often happened in you know, the pre-modern era or the early modern era, is that infants would lose eyesight. They would go blind in one or both eyes due to infections. And this was especially common if the mother had some venereal disease. So various venereal diseases like chlamydia, for instance, can actually infect the infant's eyes during the process of childbirth and lead to them losing their sight. So this is another reason this was also attributed to the evil eye, and this then stimulated demand for protective drugs, ointments, and amulets that in some way related to the female sex, childbirth, and eyesight. For millennia, people have created objects. They've also used drugs, herbs, potions, incantations to try to protect against the evil eye, but also very often amulets and magical objects. And these objects might be made from mirrory metals, shiny metals that are thought to deflect the projection of the evil eye. Also, some of them can take the form of an eye, a sort of beneficent or protective eye to counter the evil eye. And those are still produced. You can buy them at souvenir shops. And also there is a common custom of creating protective amulets that might in some way relate to the evil eye in the form of a hand because hands, especially the right hand, are understood to be protective. So you might think of the amulet known as the Hamsa, or Hand of Fatima, in the form of an open hand, which represents welcoming and protection. Sometimes these Hamsa, or Hand of Fatima, amulets also have an eye set into the palm of the hand. So it's sort of double. It's the protective hand and the beneficent eye counteracting the malevolent eye. 
So all of these customs and associations, it seems, come together around the Higa amulet. It combines a lot of these ideas. It is a protective hand, and it relates to childbirth. It seems to be a reference to the female sex and the process of birth. So these Higa amulets, as I said, in Spain, they seem to have been created out of jet and other minerals. In other places, other stones were used. But this is an unusual case in that these Higas found at Los Adalles were made of silver. And that, I think, is also significant magically speaking, because silver is shiny and mirrory, and so it also invokes that idea that uh, shiny metals and mirrory objects can deflect the evil eye. And these particular higas that we're speaking of from Los Adalles were found in this midden near the barracks within the Presidio. And that might suggest several things. For one thing, a connection to the soldiers who were garrisoned there in the Presidio. Perhaps they were used by the soldiers, and it seems that out of the various soldiers stationed there in Los Adalles, some of them were married. Not most of them, but some number were, and the Spanish government in recruiting fighters actually favored married men. They saw them as more kind of morally respectable and reliable. So it's possible that some of them were concerned about their wives and children, maybe their pregnant wives. Maybe also they affixed them to the bridles of their, their horses, which also was a custom in Europe in order to protect people on their travels. But there's another possibility here too, which we have to consider, which is that in an outpost like Los Adalles, although some minority of the soldiers and officers were married, most were not, and there was an overabundance of men in proportion to women. And this is the sort of place one routinely reads about colonial fortresses, trading posts, villages, where there was a dearth of women, and the European men would turn to indigenous women for sex and companionship, often marriage, as happened very much in the Spanish Empire. And also some women would go to these outposts and do sex work or prostitution because there was demand for those services, for female companionship and for sexual relations. And that was a way that women could make a living. And one of the hazards of this prostitution for both the practitioners and the clients was venereal disease. If women made their living off of sex with various men, these could become hotbeds of venereal diseases like syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia. So it's possible that maybe there were women doing this sort of sex work at the Presidio and among the garrison of Spanish soldiers who were dealing with venereal diseases and also with pregnancy and childbirth. So these are all possible, I would say, likely reasons that these higas might have been desired at a place like Los Adalles, and why maybe they even were produced there. So these particular higas are unusual in this way, and I think it's unique to have found three similar ones all in one place. Now, there are other specimens found in other colonies. For example, the, the look and design of these higas is fairly similar to an earring that was found in a shipwreck in Florida, and also a pendant on a necklace that was found in Santa Fe, New Mexico. There also is an interesting specimen with pictures online that is a larger brass higa with a sort of longer arm that is in the collection of the Star of the Republic Museum in Texas. So this suggests that creating higas was maybe a common or growing custom along the northern frontier, the northern edge of the Spanish Empire, right, stretching from New Mexico through Texas to Florida. And perhaps these have just been found because the United States has a lot of resources to excavate these rare colonial sites. Or it could be because, as I said, there was at these northern outposts, there was a concentration of men, especially soldiers, and very few women. And maybe that is part of what created the special market for these amulets. 
But again, the fact that there are three in a very similar style and all out of silver suggests that these might have all been made by the same craftsman in the same place at or near Los Adalles. And the basic style clearly is Spanish, right? This basic design of the Higa is clearly from Spain. But maybe the craftsperson who made these amulets might have been indigenous and serving the Spanish market at Los Adalles. There is a blacksmith mentioned in the surviving colonial records as one of the artisanal workers at Los Adalles, and there has been a partial excavation of a blacksmith's shop not far away in the Presidio. But there is no mention, as far as I have been able to find, of a specifically of a silversmith. And so maybe these higas might have been made as a sort of side project to make a bit of money by the blacksmith, or maybe they were brought from somewhere else, maybe San Antonio or New Orleans, where there was a silver worker. Both of these are possibilities because unusually silver was quite readily available all around North America and especially in the Spanish Empire. There were enormous productive silver mines at Potosí in South America and by the mid-1700s also in northern Mexico at a site which came to be called San Luis de Potosí. There was silver being mined and coming onto the market, so silver was actually even more accessible even at an outpost like Los Adalles than it was in most places in Europe or Asia. Silver could serve as a trade good, right? It could be traded back and forth, presumably to Louisiana. But nonetheless, a small amount of silver being reworked into a desired object like an amulet could actually add value. And in fact, a visitor who went to Los Adalles and reported about the conditions of the mission in 1754 said that the people there were living very well. They had silk undershirts with silver braid and fringe. And a few years later then, in, the, in 1767, when a Spanish official was sent to sort of inspect and report about the conditions of the fort, they then described the soldiers there as ragged and wearing sort of old, worn-down clothes, inadequate weapons. But they noted that even these ragged threadbare clothes had gold and silver buttons and one could speculate that possibly these silver buttons or maybe Spanish silver coins which circulated widely might have been appropriated and melted down and reworked into these amulets but nonetheless when one looks at these amulets they are not identical it doesn't seem as if they were all sort of poured into one mold they're of different sizes and they're at different stages of finishing. So if one looks at the three, one of them has sort of rough and angular markings to distinguish the fingers and the edges of the fist. And it seems as if it was just filed into this shape by some sort of sharp object and then left in that condition that we find it in. Whereas the other two are different. They, they have much more smoothed and rounded edges. And this could have happened in two ways. Possibly the craftsperson sanded down the edges in order to give them a, a softer, finer, more finished look. Or maybe they were used and handled. Maybe pe people clutched them, uh, rubbed them for luck or protection, and hence those rough edges wore down over time. And silver will do this. It's a soft metal, so those edges will round out fairly quickly. Either one of these is possible. But either way, whether they have more age or whether they were simply more finely finished, either way, the fact that one of the three has those rougher hewn edges suggests a quick abandonment. The idea that for one reason or another, these amulets were cast aside or dropped, perhaps as the fortress was finally evacuated in 1773. So regardless of exactly how that happened, the, the Higas reveal, I believe, the significance and the contention over sex and marriage and the presence of women at Los Adalles. So reportedly in its heyday in the 1740s and 50s, the fortress had about 60 to 100 soldiers, 
Most of them were recruited from various towns and villages around northern Mexico, but also some of them from jails, who were sort of, you know, convicts who were promised freedom if they served as soldiers at this outpost. Most of them had no families, right? Only a minority were married. And so when it came to sex and companionship, they surely relied largely on local indigenous women, but sometimes also high-ranking officials could have female visitors. And this, it seems, was sometimes controversial. So in the records of the mission, there is a report of an incident in 1736 when the governor and lieutenant governor left Los Adalles and went on a trip over to Natchitoches, to the French town, and they brought back with them three French women as guests, including one of them being a French officer's wife. And so these men and women then held a party at the governor's house, which went on late into the evening. So this probably raised eyebrows in the Catholic mission, and eventually a priest went out to the governor's house and broke up the party, seeing this as sort of inappropriate for these men, these officials, to be fraternizing, particularly with a married woman, late at night. And so the priest then sent away the officer's wife, to an adjoining mission for the evening rather than sort of allowing her to stay over at the governor's house. And this incident shows the difficulty of getting female company into this male space of Los Adalles and the friction and controversy it could cause. But nonetheless, we know that at least sometimes some women there were conceiving and having children, since also among the occupations of the residents of the mission, alongside this blacksmith also was listed a wet nurse. So we can see then clearly that somehow sex, conception, and childbirth were happening at Los Adalles, but in an environment like that, it could be very contentious, it could cause conflict, and ultimately, these problems around marriage, sex, and childbirth, the scarcity of women, the confusion over marital status, and venereal disease, child mortality, the danger of trying to give birth and raise children, all of these were factors then in why the population of this outpost, despite its great commercial and political importance, remained small. It never became a self-supporting, self-sustaining town. And hence, when it lost its commercial importance after 1764 and its political importance after 1772, it was simply abandoned. And the civilian population remained very small, although it seems that most of them removed to San Antonio and maintained themselves as a sort of distinct sub-society there, maybe because many of them had Caddo Indian ancestry, they spoke maybe a distinct dialect of the Spanish language, and after Louisiana was effectively under Spanish control, some of them, it seems, did move back to the area of Natchitoches. And even into the 20th century, there were some people who continued to identify themselves as adayesenos, or descendants of the people of Los Adayes. So in this way, a lot of the history and a lot of the trials and difficulties of this small society at Los Adayes and of the whole colonial experience of trying to build societies in these far remote outposts are encapsulated, I think, in these three silver amulets from Los Adayes. So thank you so much for listening. Again, if you can support, please go to my Patreon page. And also, I will announce now that on the afternoon of July 2nd, a supporter of the podcast will host a Twitter Spaces discussion where he and anyone else who wants to join can speak with me and ask questions about my process, of how I research, of how I've started this podcast, how I produce the lectures, and anything else you feel like talking about, maybe <laughs> within, within some bounds of delicacy and propriety. You can ask me about whatever you want. So the link to that will be in the description, and if you click on it early, you will 
be able to sign up to have a reminder. And then on July 2nd, it should be a live link to join that discussion on Twitter if you have a Twitter account. And if you don't already, please follow me on Twitter at Historiansplain. So thank you again so much for listening and for your support.